Hello, everyone, and welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. May our worship today be glorifying to God and a blessing to you. Amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We now pause for a moment to reflect on our sins and the forgiveness we're promised in Jesus. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. A reading from Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the fields is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, saying, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own, with interest. So take the talent from him, 
and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for today is the Gospel lesson, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Well, you've heard the sayings, cash is king, money is power, money talks, the almighty dollar, money makes the world go round. Of course, that's not literally true that money makes the world go round, but money plays a key role in all of our lives. By money in this uh, message, or by cash, which I'm, I'll be using a lot, uh, I'm not just meaning the, uh, literally money and cash, but it's all that we have, whether it's our bank accounts, our retirement plans, our cars, our, our houses, uh, our land, whatever we possess. I'm putting in this big category of, of cash. Our lesson uh, from our Lord Jesus tells us uh, three important facts about money and cash, but it also tells us our big problem with cash. And more importantly, the parable points to the one who rescues us from our cash problem. So first, uh, three fundamental facts about cash. Uh, Number one, God owns all. Now that's maybe a surprise to you, but it is true. You might think that you own your bank account, because your your name's on it, or you own your house because your name's on the deed, or you own your car, your land, but God owns all. Our first lesson reminds us the world and its fullness belongs to God. In our gospel lesson, it says of the three servants that the, the master entrusted to them his money, and they invested his, the master's money. You see, everything you have really belongs to God. God owns all. That's a fundamental fact of, of, of cash and all we possess. God owns all. Now, the second fundamental fact is that we manage what God owns. Uh, in, the, in the parable, uh, the man was entrusted Um, with the property of his master and uh, three individuals, right? One was given five bags of silver, another two bags, another one bag of silver. But they were to manage what the master owns. Just like I think of uh, an owner of a baseball team is different than the manager of the baseball team. One owns, but the other is under that uh, uh, authority and is then a manager of what the master owns. We are the manager of God's property, God's cash. And of course, we should manage that because it belongs to God. We should manage it very carefully. But for some people say, oh, uh, I can do with it whatever I want. But then number three reminds us of this fundamental fact that God calls us to an account. God will call us to account for our management. All three servants who were entrusted with bags of silver were called to account by the master. And really, two-thirds of the parable deals with the accounting. And so that tells us that that's pretty important and pretty significant. And what a beautiful commendation for the two who manage faithfully. Well done, good and faithful servant. But what harsh condemnation for the third who buried the master's money, you wicked and slothful servant. You see, there will be a day of judgment. There will be a day that we are called to account. Now, as we consider that day, what 
gifts. What's going to be a part of that day? Well, this brings us to point number two, our problem with cash. We all have a problem with cash. And you might say, what everybody says, my problem is I don't have enough of it. That's right. That seems to be your problem. If you just had more cash, things would be better. But actually, your problem is much deeper than that. Far deeper. You see, our problem stems from the fact that we do not manage God's money very well. Or even worse, we deliberately mismanage God's money. So here's a little test, an inventory, a dozen, account, a dozen accountability questions concerning God's cash. Now, uh, each one of these questions to me is, is of great significance. Do you use God's cash in ways that were pleasing to him, or do you use God's cash in ways that pleased yourself? <sighs> Tough question. Did you spend countless hours anxious and fretting about God's cash? Or did you trust God that he assigned to you just the right amount of his cash? Were you frivolous and haphazard with God's cash? Or did you carefully manage with planned use of God's money? Did you steal from God, keeping most of his money for yourself? Or did you give a generous and faithful portion to his kingdom? Did you trust in the cash more than in God, the one who gave you all? Did you invest in your own personal toys more than the kingdom of God? Did you seek God's wisdom and God's direction in the management of his cash? Did you give the leftover in your pocket for the Lord's work or the first fruits of your labor? As an employee, did you work diligently as you would for the Lord? Or as an employer, did you give good working conditions and just wages to your workers? Were you lazy about work? expecting the government or others to provide for you or to bail you out? Were you tight-fisted with God's cash or were you generous with God's cash helping those in need? Wow, these are tough questions. They're tough questions for me. The sad truth that is that all of us have failed in one way or another in the use of God's cash, in the management of God's money. All of us are guilty in this area of life. Our selfishness often blinds us to our sin in this area. But all of us have earned God's just condemnation for mismanagement, for malfeasance, for misappropriation, for embezzlement, for theft. And that is our problem with cash. But the good news is, is that God has a rescue plan for our cash problem. You see, in our parable, we see two faithful servants. Well, Jesus is like the faithful servant. God did not wash his hands of us as he, as he could have, but he sent a faithful servant, Jesus Christ. And this servant was entrusted by the master with great responsibility the master did not entrust bags of silver to the servant, but the master entrusted something far greater. All people that were created in his image. He entrusted this servant to rescue his image bearers from their own sin. This servant did not bury or neglect what the master entrusted to him, but he faithfully and sacrificially invested his very life. He died for every unfaithful servant, including you and me, winning forgiveness for those who look to him. This faithful servant is Jesus. Scripture says, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house in Hebrews 3, chapter 6. Hebrews 3, verse 6. He is the only servant that God can truly say, well done, 
good and faithful servant. Because of Jesus' faithfulness in bearing our sins on the cross, we are forgiven for our mismanagement of God's cash. And then when we take that to heart, what Jesus did for us, when we really believe that God loved us so much to rescue us, when we trust that we are completely forgiven for our mismanagement of God's cash, then we can begin to faithfully manage his money. We can seek God's wisdom in the management of his cash. We can trust his word and his promise. Promises such as this one from Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Or in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Or this one first from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Instruct those who are rich, and that's most of us here who are listening, instruct those who are rich in this present age not to be conceited and not to put their hope in the uncertainty of wealth, but in God, who richly provides all things for us to enjoy. Did you get that last part too? God richly provides all things for us to enjoy. We're not to, to go around with sad, glum faces, but to enjoy the things that God does provide. As we look to manage God's cash, it is vital to let him first manage our hearts with faith, with forgiveness, and with love. These come with a faith relationship with Jesus. And because of Jesus, we do not need to suffer guilt from past money mistakes. And some of us have made big money mistakes in a variety of ways. We do not need to bear that guilt because Jesus bore that guilt. Oh, we can learn from those money mistakes, though. And because of Jesus, we need not be plagued with anxiety and worry about money. If we have enough, if we're going to really get through. No, uh, we do our best, but we trust Jesus for the rest. Because of Jesus, we can have power to stop impulse buying, wasting money. Power to stop living hand to mouth. And power to save. And this power to spend wisely. Because of Jesus, we can be humble and seek the assistance of others, whether they're accountants, whether they're financial planners or advisors or budgeting tools, uh, or wise Christians who can help us for the management of God's cash. We can be humble and, and, and seek the help that we need. And because of Jesus, we can develop self-control in the financial areas. We can make a budget and we can stick to it. And because of Jesus, we can be generous, knowing that God is so generous toward us. And because of Jesus, we can lay up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. Treasures in heaven where moth and rust or inflation will not consume. Because of Jesus, we can make the necessary changes to faithfully manage. God's cash. God is the giver of all good things. And he's given us cash. All the things we have to manage. Through Jesus, we can be forgiven for our mismanagement. And through Jesus, there is power to manage faithfully. So that when we're called to accounting, we can hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for entrusting to us all different types of cash, money, and land, and houses, and cars to manage. We confess that so often we have selfishly mismanaged what you've entrusted to us. But Lord, we are so thankful for your son Jesus, for his forgiveness, and for his peace. Help us by your Holy Spirit then. Lord, to look to Jesus and manage what you've entrusted to us 
in faithful ways. In his holy name we pray. Amen. We now join in confessing our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have not already done so this week, I would like to encourage you to reflect upon your tithes and offerings to the Lord. If you would like to mail in your tithes or offerings, you may do so to the mailing address that is on the screen. If you would like to give your tithes or offerings online, you may do so on our website. Simply go to the website rlc.life and click the Give Online button. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.